So good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be telling you about our integrated, printed, self-rechargeable wireless sensor node for condition monitoring of high-value rotating equipment. But the way I'd like you to sort of think about it is how many of you have ever dropped your phone, cracked your screen, gotten a bunch of dents in it, and would you not like to do that? Just raise your hand if you don't want to destroy your phone or anything else when you drop it. Great. So the only way that we're going to be able to do something like this is to start developing these flexible electronics with this printed technology. And what we're doing right now is developing some of the first proof of concepts to show that these things can be done with multiple inks, multiple manufacturing processes to develop these systems that are flexible, that can do all of that. So our first application that we're investigating is condition monitoring for rotating equipment, pumps and the like, because they're deployed in basically just about every factory that you can imagine uh, in the US and many of them in the world. So we have uh, already developed in our lab a and an energy harvesting system that can actually harvest the vibrations from these pumps. This was developed by uh, Andrew Waterbury, a previous graduate student. You can see this little box in the top left corner of this pump. So this was deployed inside the Marvell Nano Lab, which has $60 million worth plus worth of equipment. It's the place where we do prototyping, where all of our students do research and develop all these nanotech devices. So if a pump goes down, that's a catastrophic failure. And that's a huge problem when it comes to money and time that's lost, not just for developing uh, equipment and the time involved, but also for having to uh, maintain everything and maybe get brand new parts. So what does that actually look like when you're looking at a pump? So you have first, you buy a new pump, you put it in, you've got running and wear. Uh, the system sort of acclimates the, the type of load that it's going to have, and then you get this steady state wear. And then at some point, you get this rapid catastrophic failure. If we can prevent that, we could save thousands of dollars in time and um, uh, so time, research hours, and maintenance for all of these systems across the world. So what does the data actually look like for all of these things when we're looking at it? So we're looking at vibrations, so you see a waveform. This is typically what a piece of information from a vibrating, piece of vibrating equipment will look like, and this will change as the device wears. You can see how it'll uh, increase in frequency over time. And then you can see also how we can just charge and send packets from scavenging energy directly from the system. So we'll charge it, send a couple packets, charge it, send a couple packets. We can get data continuously over the lifetime of the system to provide a very good, reliable model to understand exactly what's going on. So we want to turn this whole thing into a printed platform. And the other thing is these pumps tend to be hot themselves or they're near very hot sources. So we can use thermoelectric generators to harvest waste heat that comes out of all of these systems. We've got printed batteries on board that will be able to store the power for long-term use. We've got supercapacitors to power the high current draw from the radio. Uh, we just have a commercial off-the-shelf accelerometer and radio because I have not seen any successfully printed radios or accelerometers on the market quite yet. So as you've seen before, we've got these printed devices that we're making, and this is actually a printed battery that's coming out. So a couple things I want you to notice. One, we're printing right now on a glass slide. This is an insulating substrate, and we've already printed in the sort of gray silver. That is the current collector, and then we're also printing the cathode directly on top. So we can print all the components on pretty much any kind of substrate that you want. So it's a flexible insulator we could print directly on conductors, so we have a lot of options. There we go. So the other thing is that we can also print these traces. So we don't want to have to purchase very expensive PCBs uh, from companies and then we're beholden to them for, for uh, deploying any of our devices. So we can actually print all the traces with these nanoparticle inks. We have good fidelity. You can read the numbers that are down there. We can get uh, to micron <coughs> level scale in terms of accuracy and what we can print with things like screen printing. The way that you imagine t-shirts are printed, we can use the same manufacturing techniques to actually print all of these things. So how about the battery? So the battery, uh, we use this printed assembly, and you can see these fully printed cathodes on the left. Our goal ultimately is to be able to scale this up to these large roll-to-roll -roll processes. So this is me over here, and I'm about six foot four. So this was printed, this long strip, uh, in about 10 seconds. You could print all those things out when you get to high throughput. So we could develop devices that are thin, flexible, and bespoke very, very rapidly as we scale up. And the magic that makes all of our, uh, our batteries work is that we're using this ionic liquid-based gel polymer electrolyte. 
it's stable in air, it's stable up to like eight volts uh, and stable up to about 100 degrees Celsius. So it can work in all of these different environments, whether it's very hot or not. Um, and you can see it here. So we can actually take these zinc batteries, make them rechargeable, flexible, and safe in air. Because you don't want to put a lithium cell next to a very hot source. So as we've seen from other things, that could be very bad. So what does the performance actually look like for these printed cells that we've made? So we've been able to get to about 1 milliamp hour per centimeter squared, which is fantastic, because that means we can have smaller footprints, better performance, and longer lifetimes. Is really what all that comes down to. And <coughs> most of you imagine, you know, when I say zinc cells, maybe you think of an alkaline cell, which is composed of, of zinc and manganese dioxide. Those don't cycle, whereas this cycles. So with the advances, advancements that we've made, we've taken batteries that typically don't, and we've put them into a, a completely new realm. We're doing the same thing with the supercapacitors. Here's a cross-section of the work that was done by uh, Martin Cowell and uh, some of our undergrads. So this is our composite carbon electrodes with this gel polymer electrolyte. And you can see right here, it's about 200 microns. This is very, very thin. As we continue to optimize these systems, we can get these things even thinner. And our performance is fantastic on these also. You can see the black line on the right. This is how much power a radio is going to pull when you actually have to transmit data with it. And that's really your limiting factor with pretty much all of these systems when you're deploying things with radios on it. You need to know exactly how much power you're going to draw. And the supercapacitor is perfectly designed for being able to provide high power over a short amount of time. So we can definitely achieve that with all of our systems that we've shown so far, just by printing these things onto a substrate and hooking it up. So we're going to scavenge energy from latent waste heat that comes out of stuff. And you can imagine that these uh, other places that where the heat may be would be on engines. You can imagine opening your car, and you could put one of these uh, devices on your uh, engine manifold, harvest heat from that. And we could tell you, how is the condition of your, uh, your car engine doing over its lifetime. Do you really need to have maintenance on it right now or not? Because we could tell by the vibrations. And then same with things like steam turbines or combustion turbines on the uh, natural gas turbines that you can see on the left. There's an incredible amount of heat. So we can get a bunch of power from that with fewer devices. So again, depending on the scenario, we can divine and print all of the components for whatever size and geometry we need to fit the application very specifically. So we've got this test bench that we've set up. And this has been uh, a great deal of work that's been done by uh, Marco Salvioli, from, uh, who's here from Italy. Uh, you can see here, this is the thermoelectric in here. We can wrap these things around a pipe. Normally, you can't really wrap a thermoelectric generator around a pipe. They're usually these, these square, rectangular platforms that are all ceramic. You can't bend them. You can't wrap them around things. So we can optimize the geometry, again, exactly for the application. And in our lab, we can do all the testing that we need. <coughs> Imagine you're in, uh, you put this in a car or some environment where there's some air blowing. We can actually uh, determine exactly what kind of performance benefits we're going to get when we deploy in that field, and we can optimize specifically for that. So looking at this, with about 16 meters per second of airflow, and let's say we have a, a 30 degrees Celsius temperature difference, uh, so across the thermoelectric elements, that's how you generate power in these. You can get about uh, 17 microwatts for that. Again, higher temperature differences yield better performance. But this is for a single thermoelectric module. All of these systems are going to be deployed with multiple thermoelectric devices in parallel. And on top of that, they can also be wrapped up into very small uh, packages. Imagine wrapping up a piece of paper around a pencil. That's essentially the footprint that we're talking about. So we can get very high density uh, energy harvesting from latent heat very easily for, again, many of these applications. So I'm talking about low power, all these things. What does that actually mean? So low power, this is uh, a, um, a Nordic semiconductor radio. And this is just something that we bought from SparkFun, and just very, uh, very cheap also, which is, is great news as we're developing this and moving forward, is that we're talking about microamps that are pulled. As, bad, as um, uh, radio technology continues to improve, these, this will come down. And uh, our footprint for all of these things will also come down. And our lifetimes of all of these devices will improve dramatically. But we're talking about, what, 120 microamps of uh, current draw, uh, or maybe even 320 in these standby modes. So we can have these things run. When we're talking about 1 milliamp hour per centimeter squared for these cells, we can say, oh, we're going to put down eight of these squares on the surface and make sure this thing can run for 24 hours without anybody touching it, any energy harvesting. Let's say somebody has to go down for maintenance. It's going to still be able to support itself. 
So we want to make sure that we can absolutely model these things and design it correctly early on. So we developed this detailed model, uh, separating all the components from each other to know how things are going to perform and to be able to um, choose the right designs and equipment for each part. So this is what it looks like. When you run the model and you get results, you can see these purple peaks on here. That's when you're transmitting. That's the highest power condition inside of any of these systems. And we want to know exactly what that is. And the other thing is, if we're drawing that much power from it, will that completely deplete the battery? Will that completely de deplete the supercapacitor uh, to a point where we can't actually continue uh, to run the system? So we want to know that before we're printing and deploying these things. So this is what it looks like for the battery. If you don't have enough current, if we maybe didn't design enough thermoelectrics on it, um, we, we will see a, a drop in, in the potential as every cycle it continues to get lower and lower and lower. But we can do this before we actually deploy and print anything. We can see that we can design it so there are enough thermoelectric generators on there to be able to power it for much longer amounts of time. So we have been able to produce this system. Our goal is to put it on a single substrate. Everything's flexible, uh, high power, long lifetime to be able to basically save incredible amounts of money and time for researchers all over, uh, all over campus in the country. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank all of you and ask you for any questions that you may have. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm Adrian Kendall, the Energy Commission, the Energy Research Program. Right. I, I just want to be clear on the applications you want for this. So, mm -hmm. so you have these sensors. Yep. They, they pull power from the thing they're sensing, so you don't have to separately power them. Mm -hmm. One example you gave of use was to know when maintenance was needed. Um, this is related to energy, so there must be some use in this monitoring as well for... Um, deciding how to run things more efficiently. Sure. And I just wanted to check if that was the case and if there's other uses I'm not thinking of. Absolutely. So the, the major, uh, one of the major points of this research is that it's not simply just this is the one thing that we can do with it. We can swap out thermoelectrics for another kind of energy harvesting. We can swap out the sensors. So right now we're using an accelerometer for detecting vibrations. We can change that sensor out for something else. Maybe it's an oxygen sensor. Uh, if you talk about efficiency, we can sort of replace the sensor with whatever we might need to detect exactly what you'll want to know to improve the efficiency of any of these systems moving forward. So it's flexible in that way also. Seems to me you combine this with a, with a one gigabyte memory stick <laughs> and uh, you can create a sensor for <coughs> tens of dollars mm -hmm. that would basically measure something at one second, revolu one second resolution for decades. So uh, you could. So some of, the, some of the problems come down to, uh, again, the power. If you put on like a one gig stick uh, or 10 gig stick, we have to know exactly how much power that will draw to actually do some of the right operations, which are some of the reasons why we have, um, we're using the wireless radio. And also for a lot of these systems, when you're doing very long term uh, data acquisition. You don't necessarily need one second resolution. Uh, ideally, you could actually produce systems that have that kind of resolution in time, but you'll have to expand the platform for more power. Well, it seems, it seems that with your capacitors and batteries, you could save up energy for the right operations. Yeah, right? absolutely. So that, so that it's almost no cost to have the super high resolution because you have the infrastructure for, for saving up that energy for the right operations. Right. It really comes down to the, the application space because sometimes you're uh, geometry constrained. So if you don't necessarily have enough room to have enough power on board to get all of that data, then that would be the only real limit in terms of... In yeah, terms of but design. you can imagine all those environmental scientists who are trying oh, yeah. to monitor the environment. And oh, now absolutely. And you've got something that's 20 or 30 bucks. Sure that they can throw around to come back 20 years later and have the super high time resolution monitoring. Exactly. Yeah. They wrap it around a tree. There's a belt around a tree and we've got the sensors on it to do all of that stuff. Come right. Back 10 years later. Sure. Yeah. Can 
More questions? Very good. Okay. Thank you. Richard. Thanks.